Hello, friends, and welcome to the Optimized Advisor Podcast, where we focus on optimizing the well-being and best practices of insurance and financial professionals today. On this show, our objective is to help you optimize your life, optimize your profession, and learn from other optimized advisors. I'm your host, Scott Heinela. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome, welcome, David McManus. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming in. I know this is a very busy time of year, uh, certainly busy within your practice. Uh, No excuse to that. Indeed, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. We've chatted a little bit about this um, for a few months now. Uh, You know, you may or may not know this, but we've been doing this, uh, the Optimize Advisor podcast, just over a year. Right. And uh, having a little bit of time to unpack some things about your story, your history, some of the uniqueness about your practice. Uh, The goal of any of these is certainly to be a little insightful, informative, a little entertaining if we could be. Okay. As we'll do our best, see how that goes. Sounds good. Yeah. So first and foremost, the question when I always have an advisor like yourself, you've been how many years in the business? Roughly speaking. 26. Okay. 26 years. Very good answer. Um, I th- it's funny because I, I find that in our space, there is not a traditional journey to, to becoming an advisor. Some where it's like, I knew at an early age, I wanted to be quote unquote, a stockbroker, right? Not really knowing the context of what that really means. And that's my story. And here I am more of, of an insurance risk management expertise, as opposed to your you know, consensual, traditional financial wealth, financial advisor, wealth manager, I took a little tangent, but it's interesting. I find it's rare that advisors are like, oh, I knew at an early age, this is what I was going to be. It's some unique story that leads to where they find themselves. And what uniquely is their journey, uh, a lot of the times is is a driver of their level of success and where they are today. And it's so unique. I'm always fascinated by that. So long way around all of that. Sure. How did you find yourself to become a financial advisor, wealth manager? I think since I was a teenager, um, I saw a financial planner in my family and, and thought, okay, that is a good, uh, a good direction to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, Obviously, you see financial you know, financial advisors, and some of them drive fancy cars, live in nice houses, and it's like, okay, I could do that. Um, and I didn't know much about financial planning at the time. Um, not really stockbroker, but I financial advisor. Right. Uh, so I wanted to do that. Um, ended up going to San Diego State, and they have an undergrad program in financial planning. Okay. And so my degree is actually in financial planning. I have a financial services degree. Mm-hmm. Um, the professors that I had there were fantastic. They, you know, uh, they actually wrote questions for the CFP. Um, two of them wrote the different books the CFP board uses. Mm-hmm. So graduated with a degree in financial planning and a certificate in personal financial planning. Okay. And went right into it. So where was the first firm you were hired on? So graduated in May, I think it was. Uh, got married in August. Um, wow. And yeah, to my high school sweetheart, 26 years. So you proposed when? Um, if you graduated in May, married in August, when did you propose? That was After early, graduation? Yeah, that was before. It was, before. okay, yeah. okay. We, we were engaged through college. Wow. So that's yeah. not dissimilar to me, by no, the way. I know. I, uh, let me think about this. No, no, I proposed to Melissa uh, the summer after I had graduated from college. She okay. was still going. She right. had one year left. Yeah, so did Kim, yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. She still worked and or still went to school in our first year of marriage. San Diego State as well? Uh, she went back, she went, transferred to Long Beach. Got it. Okay. Yeah. My alma mater. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So married in August. Married in August. Um, literally started the morning after my honeymoon. Got back on Sunday, started Monday because, you know, I plan things. Mm-hmm. So uh, we planned that. <laughs> <laughs> um and by the way, it was at American Express Financial, okay. and I bugged them, uh, I bugged the 
for the guy that ran that literally every week. I would call him from from San Diego uh, to try and get this job, and they just nah, they don't take college kids. Um, well, after the first year, I was in the top ten percent in the nation from their calculations, and the next year they hired a whole bunch of college kids. What was it about American Express that attracted you to want that position within that company, as opposed to however many others that existed that did recruit right out of right. college? So the family member I was telling you about, that's where he was working um, at the time, wasn't when I started. Okay. Um, and so uh, I was told that would be a great location to learn and to learn how to do financial planning. Um, was it? I will say quickly realized I knew more about financial planning than a lot of the people training me. Okay. Um, I used to run down the hall to my boss and uh, the, one of the managers there, Arthur Cooper, and I would say, hey, this person, true story, this person just told uh, this client that if his wife has never worked, she will not receive Social Security. Um, that's, that's wrong. I, I, you know, yeah, and, that doesn't sound right. Doesn't sound, and so I go back, he's like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Uh, I had five hundred thousand dollar IRA being roll or uh, rollover for this client, and yeah. he called later that night and said, "I checked my CPA. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Cancel all the paperwork." Oh man! And so, and that kept happening, uh, and finally ended up saying, "Let me do this on my own. Um, I will, you know, because we had to be, you know, we had to be. I was supposed to sit there." and watch somebody give a presentation. Right. Um, and Kind of in the shadows, right? right? As a junior advisor. And it's like, wait a minute. You make the phone calls, get the client in, somebody else come, you know, sells and, and teaches you how to be an advisor. And damn it, this is the way we do it. Right. And yeah. yet I kept, things kept being wrong. And I kept going back to Arthur and saying, hey, this, this is wrong. Short version of that is um, after about exactly two years there, uh, said, hey, we... We should uh, try something else. I have an opportunity to go to, to Lincoln. I thought we were going independent. Um, and uh, so we both did that together. This is with Arthur. This is with Arthur. We both okay. left and went together. To Lincoln. Uh, to Lincoln. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and that was the beginning of your true yeah. partnership establishment. We weren't to working together at the time, but we went there in our own practices together. Um, Loosely he, stating it partnered. Okay. Yeah, loosely stayed in it. And then a few other advisors came over uh, and joined us there. And uh, another long story short, uh, he left and then kept trying to get me to join him. And finally, in July of 2001, we uh, joined firms. And uh, my practice, his practice, we started Cooper McManus. Okay. And when? 2005? 2001. 2001. Okay. Yeah. Wow. It, uh, Interesting time. I, I think if we look back, it was a, right. It was uh, uh, July 2001. Um, look back on it, I think we had probably $30 million between the two of us. And uh, we built that between our own production and then also we're an OSJ branch and ended up uh, bringing in 45, 50 advisors since then. Mm. Interesting. Here we are today. Yeah. Life is blessed. It's good. So going back, I want to segue yeah. for a moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with many of our advisors, we kind of ask these, I, don't, I would say, some thought-provoking questions, and it's more of a way that we can get to better understand you. And another parallel, um, that you grew up with your parents, which you, which is interesting. Instead of answering the question, what's the most meaningful gift you've ever received and why, mm -hmm. most people will answer a physical object or something that they received as a physical gift. Okay. Uh, your answer was not. It was to grow up with your grandparents. They helped mold you into the way that you were. So my, I was raised by a single mother, private school teacher, and she was wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. My father passed away when I was, uh, let's see here, Wendy was 11. So I was probably four. I tell people I have po postcard images of my father, but that's it. I never had any relationship. But point being, my grandparents, they go by the name of Nana and Papa. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, he was my father figure. He was my mentor. They were the example of just living a good marriage, a great life, uh, not overly wealthy, but did everything in my perspective, right? And through the lens, the right way. Right. So th they were an example 
for me in my life. Uh, again, I'm very intrigued by how you responded to that question as a gift. So what was your relationship with your grandparents and why did they impact you so much? I, I always had a strong relationship with them. We were always at their house. Uh, they helped. I mean, they were the, the matriarchs and patriarchs of our, uh, of our family. And we had a great other family. Other grandparents were great also. But these uh, grandma and poppy were the ones that I uh, lived with throughout a part of my teenage uh, years. Um, I think I moved out of the house around 16. Um, when I say moved out, I mean, mom, stepdad, they were doing their thing, and I ended up uh, leaving and... Uh, moving in with them? Moving in with my grandparents. All right. Okay. And they were single marriage, whole way through. Yeah. yeah. My so, grandpa owned a company and was very successful, sold it, got screwed um, on the sale. And, and uh, uh, so I, I watched how he struggled going from, you know, everything he had to uh, still very, very well off, but uh, just different than what he had, their retirement had planned. Yeah. Um, so I saw how the finances impacted them. Um, I remember, I think it was 2000 and I say it was 94 okay. was that I was just, we were just about to get married and, and, uh, my grandfather was, uh, selling the ho his house he lived in, in like you know, San Clemente with an ocean view, right? You know, was, you could see the whitewash. It was fantastic. And I, I was like, Hey, let's, you know, we'll help you make the, the payments so you can keep the house and then, uh, and down the road, we'll sell it. And. My uh, my wife's like, we're not living the first year of our marriage, you know, in the home <laughs> you know, with your grandparents. I'm like, right. yeah, it's probably not, probably a good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, they sold that house for like, I don't know, I think it was two hundred and forty thousand. Oh my um, gosh! I was like, oh, crazy. Um, but so my hindsight's always twenty twenty though, right? right? It, I mean, it's it like, always is. Who would have known what appreciation we've seen in in the last few decades? And that was, but it is staggering to to right. see. Well, that was a time when the real estate market was just falling like uh, like crazy. So, um, but other than that, my grandparents were just um, I mean, my my wife and my grandmother were like best friends. I mean, my grand they were just great people you could sit and talk to forever, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were safe. You know, you could come you come tell them anything, or or and they would just help out and mm -hmm. all the time. Um, yeah. I, I bought a car. My first car I bought when I was 15. I couldn't even drive it yet, um, and I had payments on it. I was working as a as a waiter at an Italian restaurant, um, five star Italian restaurant. I was wearing a tuxedo, um, and I, they would drop me off. And before before I got a car, I finally get a car. I found the one I wanted, and he went down to the bank and helped me co get a cosign. He cosigned on the loan. Mm. Um, they gave it was a few grand. They gave right, it to him right. just because he was. He was, he had accounts there. Right. But, you know, they added my name to it. So I technically co-signed the loan. It's great. Right. Um, I made payments. I think it was $78 a month for, you know, until that car was paid off. Right. So 66 Mustang. It was great. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it's funny how just certain people impact us in life and mold us to who right. we are and kind of shape the people that we are through those experiences and the relationships that we had with people and uh, hopefully we're blessed enough anyone in life to be exposed to those that set good examples and right. and and we as people are insightful enough to absorb those qualities it's easier said than done i think for a lot of people it is i don't know um okay so looking at your practice today there's obviously been a lot of shift and growth and and development tell the story about uh, we were talking about this at dinner the other night, mm -hmm. how pre-pandemic COVID that all of your meetings were in person. Right. And now, what does it look like? Well, I think when you first start, and we go back to 26 years ago, I would meet anybody anywhere, at their house or you know, any time of day. And as you grow your practice, it's uh, you end up saying, nope, all meetings are you know in the office unless it's somebody who's probably in their 90s. Um, so how many in-person meetings could you successfully conduct in a given day in your office? 
So, because I would, I would define that as being the most efficient in-person way to product your business right. as opposed to running around, running around, meeting with clients, very inefficient. I mean, giving time for, you're not sure how long this meeting is going to go and then you have to, you know, eat and you've got people walking through and interrupting your day. I'd say four. Four, yeah. Because you can't have, you really don't want clients leaving right. saying bye to clients while others are sitting in the lobby waiting to come in. I've done that, but yeah. Yes, it happens, it happens, but that's not by design. No, no, no. And, and we wouldn't categorize that as optimal. No, it's not optimal. Right. So probably four. Four. Okay. Yeah. And, and the day's done. Yeah, and, and, and we're, and we're waxed too. And, yeah. You and, and you're, you're spent. Yeah. Um, but because also the meetings go longer than you think and you, there's not a deadline. Uh, you give yourself enough time so there isn't that overlap, um, which it's different today. Right. Okay, so today. So what happened in March? This would have been March of... 2020. 2020. Uh, you go into a meeting and you, we don't need to go into the details, but you realize, wait a minute, this isn't going to work. I think it was... It took a while to get this probably dialed in right. You know, get you know, because again, it was going to take two weeks and flatten the curve. Right. Um, and so That's we'll what we all back thought. in two so weeks, right? So we'd be home at 3.34 in the afternoon. Right. It'd be happy hour on the driveway. Right. Two weeks. This will be fun. Be great. <laughs> yeah. And since then, I think, you know, everything, the world has shifted and changed. And now um, we've just had to change the way we do business. Um, honestly, it's more efficient now. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot more efficient. I can have twice as many meetings in one day. And... Now I have it, it, it's structured different. I have a, uh, one of my team in every meeting taking notes. Um, but usually those those meetings aren't going over because you get everything done in that period of time you, you need to. Um, and then you've got another meeting. You, I've, I've done back-to-back -back meetings in a day. Yeah, you're exhausted, but I've done eight meetings in a day, all back-to-back, -back, and haven't had to worry about putting in notes or telling my team, here's what we're doing, because I had people on the calls with me. And all of the behind the scenes stuff is being done. So I can just focus on the client. So the last time you met with a client in person was when? Uh, last week. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, still, okay. still doing meetings occasionally in the office as needed. You know, as needed or as clients want. There's clients want to be in person. And of I'm course. totally fine with that. Yeah, I, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't mind doing that at all. Uh, right. But I'd say most of the time, it's it, at 95% of the time right now, it's, it's zooms. Right. And so in that, uh, you find that, <clears throat> so who's, who's scheduling the meetings? What's the process in doing all of this? Let's talk a little bit about the team. Who are the seats on the bus? Yeah. What is the responsibilities of your team members and how does that work so that we can operate efficiently? Yeah. I, I have an amazing team and they were efficient before. They are surprisingly more efficient now. Um, they, they love working at home and they are good at it. And I have, I have just an amazing team. Um, to answer your question, Marissa is, is my right hand. She schedules everything. And I mean, if I actually schedule an appointment, it's trouble. Um, cause I've probably messed it up somewhere. Right. Um, and she, she is on, she's emailing, she's calling, she's, having conversations with clients, scheduling the next uh, appointments, you know, confirming appointments. And she also does all of the um, paperwork that's needed too. Okay. So she's my admin, you know, executive assistant. She is um, phenomenal. Okay. Really great. Been with you for how long? Four years. Easy to find? No, I went through a handful of people and it was always a challenge and, and people in the industry, not in the industry. She was not in the industry, but she was referred to me by a friend of mine, really close friend. And I will tell you for the first year, frustrating as ever. Um, <laughs> she didn't know, she didn't know anything about our industry. Right. And a lot of acronyms. I mean, yes. the, the learning curve is steep. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I was typing an email before I came here, and um, I was on the phone with a client, typing an email to her, and she she calls me on the way here, and she goes, "By the way, I just I had everything done that you were sending me that email. I was and I was pushing send because um, she she can re she can read my mind. And she's gotten to that point, yeah. and 
it's there before I need it or before I even know I needed it. Um, I have a I have a Zoom meeting and she's got it set up and below there it's here's the last email they sent. Here's all the information about the uh, about them in case you forgot. You know, by the way, they have a kid at you know this college or that place. I mean, she she literally has it all spelled out. So if anything I need, it's right there. Mm. Here's their performance on their portfolio. Here's here's everything. She does. Wow. She's great. Yeah. Um, and does all the paperwork. And if she needs something, she's not a, not afraid to call the client and and ask and 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 gather. I don't have to go do that. Yeah. Very hard to find. And. A diamond in the rough, and again, first yeah. year was was not um, not that great, but we got through it. She was a business owner herself, and so she understands you know what I'm going through mm-hmm. and um, and thinks ahead and, and knows what I'm looking for. Yeah. So. Okay. Next, Anita. Anita essentially Anita has ran an RIA for 30 years. Uh, we ended up buying that company back in 2010. And uh, she came with uh, came with that, and I mean that was part of the deal. Is we'll, we'll keep the staff on, right? Um, and you know you're not really sure how that would work at that point in time. Um, she's amazing. She's she's again the same thing. She does things on her own without even uh, knowing. She's fully licensed. She's uh, she has her master. She's a CF, uh, CFP as well, and she works with clients and, and just on her own, takes care of clients. And and like right now she's making sure all the RMDs were done and there's two or three that were missed. And so we're getting that done this week and stuff that I don't have to think about. So in your, in your practice today, you are predominantly a, the rainmaker. So meeting with new prospective clients that are introduced to you and hopefully brought on as clients. Uh, what percentage of your time would you say is allocated to that right now? Would you guess percentage-wise? Is it 20, 30, 40? About getting new clients? Yeah, the, the prospecting aspect of it, the discussions and, and conversations as it relates to onboarding new clients. I think that's Because we'll get to that. Most of what I do. Okay. Uh, right so now, most of what you do. One more person also. Okay. Uh, Who's that? Sue. Let's not forget about yeah, Sue. Yeah, I can't forget Sue. Okay. Uh, Sue is, uh, uh, has been here a couple of years now. Okay. Um, no, a year and a half. And she is an MBA, also a CFP, also licensed. Uh, she is in pretty much every meeting that I have. She's the one taking most of the notes. And um, Yeah, we've talked a little bit about that. Meticulous yeah. notes. Meticulous. I, I think a lot of the time. Also research. Does a ton of research. Of research. Okay. So I think a lot of times advisors, uh, we don't have somebody taking our notes. So we find ourselves either being distracted right. because we want to gather the pertinent details and the information that's very, very much necessary. But what it does, it detracts from the flow of the conversation. It does. And your effectiveness in it, the time that you do have? It's the effectiveness in the time, but also... When you're focusing on the notes, you can't think of some of the other things to either ask the client or I'll, I'll be listening to what the client says. I know she's taking notes and it'll allow me to think of other things that that um, that we can do with this client. Hey, have you thought of doing X, Y or Z? Um, and so it allows me to just to ask better questions. Well, and be fully invested in listening. Right. Not easy. In many cases, right? No, we, we can't multitask. Right, right. Well, everybody has their capacity, but also I would imagine you're dealing with some some intricate cases uh, and also some, some more, well, let's talk a little bit about that. So your practice today is very, very, you have the opposite problem that many have, which is procuring new prospects and clients is a challenge. In your situation, the, the uniqueness that you've been able to build uh, is too many. I don't know if I'd say too many clients, but I don't know if it's ever too many. But it's yeah. never too many. Uh, although everybody has a bandwidth, right? In a capacity. There, there is a bandwidth. There. Let's just say that having introductions and conversations with new clients is not a challenge for you and your team. No. We, okay. Why is that? Uh, we, I, I think the, the biggest problem financial advisors have is where's my next client? We're always 
you know, focused on here's the client I have right now or this week or this month and now what's the next. Mm-hmm. And we're always looking for hunting, that next hunting, hunt, hunting, right? Hunting, hunting for the next client. Um, we have a referral source that we have meetings set up. You know, there's tons of meetings every week, and it's all um, brand new clients or review meetings for those clients or how we're going to invest this client. We just we just got last week or the week before from from this same source. And you had just stumbled into this referral source. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Generically, can you describe that, how that happened? Uh, my son and my wife were in a car accident. He was 12 okay. at the time and couldn't get uh, – somebody ran a red light and, and almost sheared off the front of the car. Um, it was He was going about 60 miles an hour, and, and they're fine now, but went through medical expenses and bills and – and a year's worth of uh, different types of therapies, but um, he's 19, so that was seven years ago. And uh, after about a year of them not paying the bills, we finally, you know, ended up having to take him to court and sue the insurance company, and they, or get an attorney at least, and they mm-hmm. finally paid for the bills. Uh, and he received a, a small settlement, and I kept being told I needed to go talk to, with uh, with this person who's a settlement planner. Um, and you're like. I'm like, why, I'm a, why do I need this? I'm a CFP. We have <laughs> CFPs. And my, you know, my teams are all CFPs. I have CFA. I've got, you know, uh, on, on staff. And we don't. We've got this we've covered. Got the, I actually said those exact words. We've got this covered. And little did you calling know. Calling and calling and calling. And finally, I took the call and didn't realize it, just how different that world was and and um, structured settlements and all the different things. And I think most uh, people who structure, uh, overstructure and do too much, uh, somebody gets a bunch of money and they put it all into a, you know, a, a, an annuity because that's um, overstructuring. And this person actually looks at it as a financial advisor. They're licensed. They understand. And, and they look at it and, and plan out, okay, you need this much. You're going to go want to buy a house. You're mm-hmm. going to you know, have these investments. And here's your guaranteed income stream. And, and uh from this structure over here, and they do a, a, a different way of, of planning. Um, and so we ended up going to lunch, and she talked about all the advisors that she works with and realized how different we were and wanted to start working together. And that was how long ago? Probably five years ago, maybe four and a half years ago. Okay. But we... We really, it took a while to really get up and running. And right. At least a year to get up and running. To get to know each other, to build rapport and trust and what have you. But stay, you stayed with it. Yeah. It, it slowly developed into today. You'll run 10, 15, 20 client meetings a week? Uh, More? 20 to 30. 20 to 30 client meetings. Client meetings a week. And it's... And some are reviews and some are, hey, I've got, I'm, I'm buying a car or I'm doing this, you know, buying a house, buying a piece of property and, and how should I do it? And should I own an LLC? Should I do an exchange? I mean, we do a lot of that planning, um, but I'd say most of them are new clients. Um, most of them are new clients. Yeah. Okay. So can we talk a little bit about what your approach to financial planning with new clients looks like? What's the questions you ask them maybe that are a little bit different, not, not the, not the financial metrics maybe, or, or some of the more mundane traditional is what, what differences do you make or what is the, pro- how is the process different? Well, I, th- I think the process is different um, with, with these referrals and these clients that we're getting and I, and I still get referrals from my current client base, Correct. but and that's that's another thing. But I would say um, these clients typically are, are are different than most financial um, clients that we've had that have worked their whole life and put money into a four hundred one k. These are getting settlements that um, and they've never had money before, right? Or they've um, haven't had a lot of money like this. Uh, some of them have, but um, I'd say the majority of them. Um, don't know what to do with this, and they're right. kind of still in shock. And so, a lot of it. Um, well, and 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 a derivative of going through a traumatic experience in whatever capacity, right? Brought this settlement upon them. And and there's a, I, I actually went through this settlement. This this person um, had me go through some training for 
um, Sudden Money Institute, which is uh, talks about and teaches you how to work with people that have had you know either settlements or or um, you know lottery winnings is another another example. Mm-hmm. Somebody who gets a large sum of money that wasn't you know wasn't used to that, mm-hmm. and and a lot of it is shock and. Um, a bunch of the time we'll sit there and have a conversation about, you know what, we're just going to open an account and put the money there and not do anything. We're just going to let the dust settle. And it could be a month. It could be a year before we decide to do anything. We just want to take a step back and you don't need to make a decision right now. Well, you knew we need to allocate it somewhere right. and it could be quote unquote cash, cash equivalent. We don't need to deploy it in any capacity. yet. Right. We'll leave it in the money market. And I mean, I'd rather it be in a money market and we use TD. So, TD Ameritrade, um, rather than the bank, because as soon as they put it in the bank, they have the, you know, the bank reps are all over them. Of course. Yeah. Okay. So you put it under your guidance and then we can decide how we're going to deploy this from a portfolio standpoint, just like, and from there it's just like any other client. Right. Okay. Okay. And, and we'll talk and the planning that we, we do is like, I've got a, client right now who's an attorney and we're doing this with some of their fees that they they just received and we're actually helping them you know refinance a house and then sell a house buy another house um long reason for that um but you know we're doing much and we're doing tax planning with them and and some other things so we've had probably five meetings with this client in the last couple weeks so not all of these meetings are brand new initial but we had one meeting with, an, uh, with a CPA, one meeting with an estate planning attorney. This is some pretty large income this year for this, for this client. We're mm-hmm. just trying to do some year-end planning for him. So you're, you're working like a maniac yeah. right now. Yeah. Not by design. Not, look, I, I'm, not not gonna put those, I'm not going to put those words in your mouth. Right. Right. But, and it, but no, let's face it, not, none of us... Uh, who are in this space, you know, obviously these are for-profit businesses that we do as a financial advisor. We try to make a difference in people's lives. That, that's all part of this. Uh, but we are in, in business, right? Yes. Um, did you ever think you'd be like this busy as you are? And then with that, I know that faith and family is very, very near and dear to your heart. Life is a series of chapters. How do you describe the chapter you find yourself in? (laughs) Oh, man. Um, Busy, like you said. Extremely busy. Within Um, practice, for sure, because we've identified that running 25 to 30 appointments a week is significant. mm -hmm. But then with that, I know you've got a lot going on within your family as well. Yeah. Um, We've got... Uh, that one thing is that's where good staff and scheduling comes into play. Um, I'd say with probably in every successful financial advisor, you start out where you're just working and take any meeting you possibly can. And you're just, you know, it doesn't matter what time of day or night um, you're out there, you know, hitting the pavement and, and just taking meetings. I remember coming home late or not coming home um, for dinner a lot um, back in the early days. And Cause this was the only time the client wanted to meet, or this is when they wanted to meet. And I would never push back. I would just take the meeting. They're working. They, they yeah. need to, you know, roll over this 401k and I've got to, you know, that's when they've got to be there. And so I'm I was doing that. I was doing everything now. Um, we have more, it, it, it is a little overwhelming having that, uh, that many, I am actually, uh, in desperate need for a very high quality, uh, junior advisor to help train um i've interviewed a handful of people and it's surprising that um, most don't want to work right now um you know i've had i've i've heard oh yeah but i need fridays off that's why i'm hiring you i need the friday i want the friday off. <laughs> I, i've worked 26 <laughs> years to get right. to the point where i'd like to take a friday off. i'm getting to that yeah um now i hadn't worked it is amazing i just had this right. conversation yesterday with buddies who run businesses and some he's he they're multi um they're they're multinational so they're in countries yeah and uh one works with a major major lending company thousands of employees yeah it's like wait uh 
I, I don't want to go into the office. You mean I have to go into the office three days a week? They don't even want to do that. Right. Right. Well, yeah, you're young. You're just out of high school or college. This is the time in your life when you are absolutely supposed to grind and put in the time. Yeah. It is a peculiar time in this in life that we find ourselves in. I had two meetings with with two separate people that I was looking to bring on and both wanted Fridays off. And like you you know, you're, what does that mean? Did you say like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, I, yeah. And I wanted to golf when I was younger too and do all these other things. Oh, I want to spend time with family. Great. I am. I agree with that. You got to spend time with your family, but I mean, that's, we're here to build a practice and you work. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I found a lot of, there's a lot of people that um, aren't want, wanting to, to do what it takes to get to that level. So let's flip that over for a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Part of that is I think you have a very uh, strong work ethic. Your team has a very strong work ethic. Inserting that fly into the ointment, let's say it is the perfect candidate from their mindset, their credentials. They, they absolutely could emulate you. Uh, culturally, that in and of itself could be quite the challenge. Right. Uh, but but let's flip that on upside down for a minute. What could we all learn from these younger individuals who are saying, no, 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 I'm not willing to compromise certain aspects of my life mm-hmm. in exchange for the dollar. professional the dollar or professional right. pursuit? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, There's something to be said about that. Um, and I think it took... I will say in the last five or six years, I have changed the way that I, I do business. Um, even before these uh, referral sources and, and um, the clients were coming in like they are now, uh, I, I would say I, I actually went to – a friend of mine referred me to a – not a business coach, but a, a, um, a therapist that works only with financial advisors. And Interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah, here you should go see this guy. Really, uh, yeah, it helps with lots of things. Okay, great. Unbelievable guy. Um, totally changed the way I, I looked at at life and family and helped with that. So, um, you know, I, I'm a different person now than I was five years ago. How so? Give me a, uh, an example. Not as stressed. Not as you know. Uh, just dealing with kids. I've got, you know, one, you know, one just finished his master's, one in college, one in his uh, sophomore in high school and, and just the way the family dynamics work and what people are doing, um, you know, gets crazy on top of, you know, know, family and, and, and wife and house and kids and dog and, you know, dogs now because of the pandemic, we all got new dogs. Right. Um, (laughs) So we have a new puppy. Um, And, you know, with all of that, this is just a way to go and talk, but it was more, it was great. He, he would bring in business ideas um, at the same time that would help with family. Um, so it was something, I, it was just looking at it from a different perspective and it allowed me to um, get, uh, allowed me to just calm down and, and not be as stressed, I think, as I, as I was before and really make priorities. How do you gain clarity like today mm-hmm. what are, are there things that you do today like time for yourself what whatever it may be yeah uh so a couple things that one is i think is really important is for those married and have us have a spouse we have a date night every well it changes it's tuesday now but it was wednesday we've done that for probably 15 years and We've kept it, we, even when I, you know, things are crazy. On the calendar. It, on the, it's on the calendar, and yeah. we have it, and we actually do it. Yeah. Um, now, for this last year, yeah, we go out a lot. I mean, we don't mind going out to dinners in the middle of the pandemic. That's fine. Right. Um, but a lot of it was, hey, we you know, run down to the local place that we go to, and we'll just get it and eat at home. Right. And we'll, you know, help keep them in business. Yeah. Um, but so we're still, still dedicating the time, still dedicating the time, you know, and, and, and spending time. It's a good time to connect and have a conversation with your spouse. Um, 
So we've been doing that for, I say, 15 years probably. Um, that's key. That's number one. Um, doing, you know, I wake up every morning and, and read. Uh, you know, sometimes later than others, but try and get up a little bit early and, mm-hmm. and, and read. Um, there's, it's actually a, our, our church has a, a DBR, a daily Bible reading. So we go through and I wake up and read the Bible every morning. Um, that's one thing that we do. Our, our church is important to us. We have another small group on Wednesdays. So now we've switched our date night from Wednesdays to Tuesdays, and we have a, a group that we get For together. the Bible study. Yeah. yeah. We get together on Wednesdays, and it's gr- just a great group of people. So that's how one way we s- stay focused. So another thing I wanted to, to question you about, uh, I would say a non-traditional answer to a very, what I think, insightful in many cases and pro- thought-provoking and you, you answered it in wonderful color. Okay. So the question is, what's the most meaningful gift you've ever given and why? Again, many, it's a tangible item, more transactional in nature, not the case with you. Uh, a memory box that I give my clients, I'll just read your answer. That's all right with you? Yes. Okay. I have them write down and read to their children something they remember about them. Have them start with, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right. Why do you do that? How did that come to be? Um, probably 15 years ago, we started working with a gentleman by the name of Lee Brower, and he has his Brower Quadrants uh, and Empowered Wealth as part of his uh, company. And he puts money into a different perspective and, and allows you to have these conversations with clients. Um, that take it more than just about the money. Um, because when we're financial advisors, at the end of the day, we're here to you know, help people and grow their wealth. Um, but this helps the client step back and really see what's the most important. And in this case, um, this was one of his ideas, and he's done this with, with others. Um, and it's for a couple different you know uh, things. One is for a family reunion. Clients go away in a family reunion. I had uh, clients of mine do this that they took all their kids to Hawaii and it's like hey here's this box and spend some time beforehand and write for each one of your kids and grandkids that were there um, I remember when and write something that you remember about that and uh, about our family I remember when you know we went boogie boarding together you know grandpa or something like that mm-hmm. um, and so you have them do that, and you share it with the family. And then um, you tell them, tomorrow we're going to have dinner, just like we did tonight, and you guys spend some time and write about somebody else in the group here. I remember when we did this. And then keep all these in this memory box. And mm. Those are your, your memories. Um, the first time Lee Broward, you know, had us do, he had us do it ourselves. And so I wrote out these uh, five things that I remember when and my, my youngest son, we had just got back from Hawaii, and I remember when we, uh, we did, you know, we boogie boarded on, you know, in this beach in Hawaii. And I remember when there were five things on this. And I bring this home, and I hadn't showed it to him yet. And To your son? To my son. Yeah. And I was going to show it to him over the weekend. And because I was busy, and he was busy, and yeah. And so he comes home, and he's got this laminated placemat that he made at school. And at the top it says, I remember when. And he's got the same five things that I had written. Un- totally two connected. Separate, uh, totally two separate things. Wow. And I just look at it and I re- go over to my bag. I grab out mine. And I I mean, I was bawling. Yeah. Um, and I'm I imagine. showing him these things. Mine are handwritten out a couple pages and... And, uh, and, but it was the same five things that he put on his. And so I have a box and I put all of that in there. Um, you're bawling. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Showing it to my wife. Things, it's a God thing. Yeah. You know, showing it to my wife. I'm like, look at this. I, I wrote this and he, I had no idea he was even, you know, doing this at school. Right. You know, who would have, who would know? Um, another, I've, I've done this for clients who have passed away and their, their family, I had a, a very large, uh, client, my largest client, um, 95 years old, passes away, and, and they've got two kids. And um, so I give each of the two kids, and by kids, I mean, they're in their 60s and 70s, so or 70s, actually, at the time. Um, they end up, um, yeah, no, late 60s. 
um, give this to them and say, here's, here's this, uh, this box, explain to them how to do it with their kids. And, and I mean, they're inheriting a lot of money. And I'm helping the whole family and, and distribute the estate, and we keep everything in trust. And so um, six months later, one of the uh, one of the kids has a 70th birthday party in um, East Coast. So we get invited to that. And so my wife and I go, and, and we're sitting on um, – they're having a two-day party. And we're on the boat that they had uh, chartered and, and – we're sitting there um, next to, standing next to their next door neighbors who are their best friends and a financial advisor. And that's been my concern this whole time is, okay, great. Their best friend's going to take over everything. Mm-hmm. And it is a substantial amount of money. So uh, sitting there and they're at the top of the boat having, you know, have, with a microphone and they're like, hey, first of all, thank you all for coming. There's 100 people on this boat. And we'd really like to thank David McManus. I'm sorry, it's his birthday. I'm like, okay, this last year he's helped us through all this stuff and he gave us this box. And so I'm looking at it. I'm like, oh my gosh, they've got that, they've got the box. And we have um, cards down on every table and we would like you to write out something I remember when about about him, um, about my client who's turning 70. Write something down and tomorrow, we'll put it in the box and tomorrow we're going to share it at the party at our house. Wow. I was like, Oh, okay. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, financial advisor friend, look, you know, elbows me and goes, "Nice job." <laughs> <laughs> How long ago was this? Uh, it was 2008. Okay. So. Wow. Yeah. And still do that to this day. I mean, this is. They the boxes right. actually that we use, uh, they no longer sell, but um, yeah, we we do it occasionally for, okay. for, for as I can find um, when it when it works when it's yeah, the right yeah. time. Okay. It's interesting that, you know, I, I think many, what, what makes us the advisor or my, my firm different, right? How do we differentiate ourselves? What is that? And I, I, I love the fact that as many examples as there are businesses or way for people to make money, which I'm always fascinated by right. as many advisors that exist is how many different ways you can make your business and your practice, the look, the feel, the relationship unique. Absolutely. Uh, but the question begins, how are we going to be different outside of just a traditional financial planning? Because let's face it, what, I mean, if I was to ask you, do you really do anything like truly magical and unique as it relates to your approach to how you model accounts and things of this nature. I, I tell clients all the time. I mean, you, you, they're looking at hiring, you know, interviewing three other people. Great. Fantastic. I mean, all of those people can manage money. We all do it very similar. You know, you have a diversified portfolio and we can all do that part of it. It's the other stuff that we do and that we bring to the table. I review all my clients' tax returns. Um, we review their trust documents. We make suggestions and uh, to, to make changes to, to these. We bring in a CPA if they don't have one. I mean, this is all stuff that probably most advisors do, but I don't know if they look at tax returns, but we look at them. Maybe, maybe not. I would say you, you, I would, I would define that broadly as like, we're going to kill you with sir, kill you in a good way with service. Absolutely. The That's, level of service that you're going to do is one of the differentiators that we're going to do. Now, thankfully, you've been blessed enough to procure a team that's highly functional, right. highly intelligent, um, operate at a high capacity, and you have this kind of wonderful nucleus. Which didn't happen because I went, oh, this is how I want it to look. I mean, it, it kind of molded into that over time. And when we first start in this business, again, like I said, we're, we're out there, you know, just hitting the pavement trying to any new client that we can possibly get we can we can get and I'll do whatever service I, I need to 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 make them happy um, I mean I've got I've got fantastic clients um, and the other thing is with all of the service we do which is one reason why I've got 20 to 30 appointments in a week because mm-hmm. of the other added services that we're doing but the clients become friends yeah I mean they uh, the clients just become friends and we you know we, we end up, you know, loving them and, and they're, they're just fantastic. Two questions and we can close up. Yeah. Do you think you'll ever 
Could you exist entirely in a virtual environment with the team and infrastructure you have today? If push comes to shove. I mean, if a client says, I want to meet with you, yes, I understand. But has the, has the paradigm shifted potentially permanently to operate a successful firm and not have to have a physical office? Or no? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's probably the future. Um, you know, and I say that I own a building, you know, with Arthur Cooper in, right. in Irvine Spectrum. So we, we, yeah, own you, a, you have a physical office have that a you own and operate. I still, yeah, yes. I still pay for that. Yep, and, yep. and, and even with that, um, yeah, I could see that definitely. Um, you can be anywhere and do this. I had a meeting, uh, last week I was in Nashville. Uh, we bought a small place out there cause my son is going to school and we were, at that house and, and, uh, I was having meetings, you know, zoom meetings from there and clients were like, Oh yeah, you're out of town. Okay. That's great. You, we could do this a different time. Nope. This, this is, this is scheduled and planned and there's, you know, there's a reason for it. There's, there's no reason not to have it. I have Wi-Fi here. We're good. Mm -hmm. so. so many, many opportunities and I think levels of efficiencies through technology and, and, processes that allow that to happen. Yeah. Also the general acceptance of public through all means of life. Now that we operate somewhat virtually or hybrid or what have you. Right. From a planning practice standpoint, what's the major drawback to that? Or is there any, are there deficiencies? Yeah. The, some of the deficiencies are, you know, clients like to see, see you and, and, you know, shake your hand. Um, they like to see you in person. Eyeball to eyeball. Yeah, that's been the, the hardest thing, I think, to overcome. How have you done that, though? I don't think I've done it. I think the pandemic's done that. And, you know, people are, are worried or scared to come in. You know, everyone's wearing masks. Everyone's, you know, um, using hand sanitizer and, and not wanting to see you. So right. that has really been what made that happen. And, I, again, I'll meet a client, anybody. Um, Anytime they want. Of course. But you know, it seems don't like need it to. seems like most people don't want to. Right. It, it's easier for them. They don't have to drive in. And it's easier for us because I'm on, you know, I finish one meeting and literally go right into the next. What, do, how long do you want to be doing this? Have you thought about that? You're still a young I mean, man. I, how much longer? Have you given much thought to hey, this? I'm like what? Turning what? 50 in a couple months. So. <laughs> still a young man. <laughs> um, Okay, but in fairness to that point, have you given much thought to, um, you know, what 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 does the the next ten years look like? Yeah, uh, I would love to have a junior advisor or two or three um, that are helping to run the practice, meet the clients. Um, I have a great team right now, but I do need to expand that. Um, but in in this industry and in what we do, I know I've got a friend of mine who is. 80 something years old right now and he's still going into the office and 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 loving it and so but he travels six months out of the year mm -hmm. and he has an office and he's he's doing great so right I, I don't know if there's if there needs to be an end like a you know a, hey i'm going to sell the practice to somebody else or or have a good team in place where they can run it and you can still take the time off you need to right now the question my wife would be asking is are you sure you could actually let go and do that because I do have a problem with that. I have to, that's just me. I, well, I think many of us in, yeah. in this in this trade, absolutely type A, giving up that level of control, it's hard. relinquishing, it's very hard. Especially when you want it done the way you would do it. They're my clients. Yeah. I mean, I've worked really hard, and these are meaningful relationships to me that some of them have spanned yeah. decades. They're friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that, on the flip side, that is the good fortune. We, it's not like we're in a physical business where, right. let's face it, I can only do physical construction for so long. Right. Totally. My body eventually will get to the point where I, that, that ship that? has set sail. Uh, as long as I have mental capacity, that's it. you could as do this well have, into your 80s. As long as we have mental capacity. I agree. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I don't have any plans anytime soon. Another conversation though, and we can maybe wrap on this. The, the, the premium that firms are getting right today, not just in our business, but I just think with the, with the, the looseness of money today and how cheap money is business valuations are ridiculous. Yeah. And the, the premiums of 
uh, wealth management firms, advisory firms is something we've never seen before, right? I, I was talking with an uh, advisor the other day, um, and the, what they got for their practice was crazy. Yeah, I mean, shocking. You wonder if it's short-lived, yeah. if, if it's here to stay. I don't know. Question would be, what would you do? What do you do? Yeah. What do you do after? I mean, yeah. if you did that. Okay, what, sounds what, what great. You, you sell your practice. You're 50 years old. What do you do on the first Saturday <laughs> or the first Monday? Not right. Saturday. The first Monday. Right. What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, maybe go golf, but you can only do that so much. So much. So, yeah. No, I, I, I don't see myself doing that anytime soon. It's, they're interesting questions, right? And yeah. I, I, I would think many advisors are, are toyed struggling with this. But that becomes the big business question of, okay, if I did, what do I do? Yeah. Um, it's easier said than done. You can't just flip the switch on that and got, got all the answers sorted. Right. A lot you know, easier said. Than done. Well, thank you for coming in. Hey, thanks for having me. Till next time. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. Please subscribe, like, share, leave a comment or review. Be sure to check us out on social media at Optimized Advisor Podcast. Till next time.